been 22 years since we moved to Smithville and uh, haven't replaced Brother Langford yet. I've been trying to, but that's some big shoes to fill. Uh, I think Wayne probably had more of the Bible memorized than any gospel preacher I've ever been around. I'm thankful for Wayne. And uh, But Donna and I, Donna's with me tonight. She's been listening to me. She reminded me last night we we had Brother Herb also came up and did uh, a Wednesday night part of our summer series we do on uh, the, in the summer times on Wednesdays. And she talked to me about how refreshing it was to hear him last night that she hadn't been listening to me but for about 40 years. And so a great thing about your wife is that she'll be your best critic. And uh, she'll let you know. And uh, I'm always grateful, Donna, when she can be with me. She, uh, I think, is the main reason that I'm able to preach today and always has been. I'm grateful for her and her family for what they mean in my life. But thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm sorry Brother Anderson can't be here. And, of course, uh, we're sorry for his, uh, their, his family struggles. Uh, we buried my mother last July 31st, uh, 11 days shy of her 87th birthday. And uh, Don and I, of course, have both lost both of our parents. And uh, so we know all about that. Our congregation has been uh, decimated, it seems like, the last couple of years with deaths in the church and uh, people uh, related to church members. So we know all about that in Smithville, too. And that's one reason why we stay connected with the church, isn't it? Because Jesus said that the gates of Hades or hell or the grave will not prevail against the church. And so that's one of the main reasons we stay faithful is uh, so that when we get to the end of the way, we'll have the hope of eternal life. It's so good to be with you tonight. Thank you for this great opportunity. And uh, please give Brother Anderson, I'll try to speak to him myself and give him our regards, him and his uh, lovely wife and, and their family. So let me ask you to open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 10. I've been asked tonight to speak about Mary and Martha. And the characteristic tonight is, is focus. We're going to talk about focus tonight. Now let's read Luke 10 and we'll talk a lot about this passage uh, can I just ask what time that first bell will ring, or roughly how much time we have? Okay, so we've got about uh, about 40 minutes or so here at least. I need to have the invitation done when that ends, right? When this class ends, we spend the invitation before the children come back. All right. So, so here in Luke 10, let's just read verses 41 and 42. You you know that Jesus is in the home of Martha and Mary, and we'll show later that was in Bethany. And, uh, and so uh, uh, he's on his way to the cross. And so the Bible said in verse 40 that Martha was distracted with much serving. She's getting supper ready for Jesus, apparently. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her with tenderness in his voice now, please hear it. This is not... Uh, this is not uh, a woman who is a bad person, and we'll certainly see that before the class is over. But the Lord said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But Mary has chosen, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, and that will not be taken away from her. What a beautiful little cameo here of a home that invited Jesus into it at a critical time in his life. And, uh, and so we have these two sisters extending this hospitality. This particular passage captures <clears throat> one of the most common struggles that we face as Christians, really in every age, but especially in this age we're living in. And that is the struggle to not lose focus on the things that are most important in life. We live at such a rush these days. Our devices keep us speeded up. Texting and tweeting has shortened our attention span. We can't, I, I was over at Walmart uh, studying a little more while Donna went inside a while ago, and I saw a girl walking along and looking up and walking along and looking up. And we all do that sometimes if we have a cell phone. But these things uh, work on our focus, I think. And I think that the ultimate issue that Jesus is getting at with Martha here is that, Martha, you need to refocus on the big issues at hand here. And I'm going to show you from the text here in a little while. He's, 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 he's going to the cross. And he very well may have been talking about that with Mary that evening and some other people in the house, the apostles. But Martha is all distracted here. Our topic tonight is focus. Now, I've also been asked to mention Colossians 3, verse 2, and I hope we'll get to that at the end. 
where Paul said that if you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Now listen to verse 2. Set your mind or your affection, set your mind. You've got to have a mindset. You've got to set your mind. A conscious decision we have to make from time to time and remake again and again. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. We are surrounded with things on the earth. And our, our Lord teaches us, Paul taught us, to set your mind on things above, Colossians 3, 2, not on things on the earth. So, as far as I know tonight, well, what we're going to do is focus <laughs> on these two passages, especially Luke 10. And as far as I know, the word focus is not found in the Bible. But it is amazing how powerful the concept is in the Bible. So many passages, and we'll note a few along with these two as we go along tonight. I think you understand that the word focus has to do with visual definition, as when we focus our eyes on something or someone. Uh, I've got, I've got multi-layers, bifocals. You can't see the lines, so don't be looking afterwards, okay? They've got the kind now that can make you still look young. You don't see the lines. But I, I have to, sometimes I have to pull these down on my nose a little bit if the print's real small because my eyes can't focus on that, that size print at that distance. So, so it has to do with our eyes or a camera or a pair of binoculars. You twist that little thing on the top, you bring it into clear focus. So we're talking about, we're talking about our spiritual vision here. And, and the word focus can also mean a center or, uh, of interest or activity as in the following sentence, many in this generation have made climate change the focus of their attention, talking about something that becomes the center of your attention, the main thing you give attention to. And so as a verb, it means to pay particular attention to. Now in the text here before us in Luke 10, verses 40 to 42, Martha had temporarily lost her spiritual focus. Her spiritual vision became fuzzy and blurred because she is in a rush of frenzied activity in the kitchen. I don't know what it was about that meal or whatever she's doing in there, but it, 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 to her it was very important. But to the Lord at that moment, at that moment, it wasn't very important to the Lord. It's not that it wasn't important and he didn't want to hurt Martha's feelings, but he wants her to remember the Son of God is in the house. And you have a particular opportunity here as I'm on my way to the cross that you're never going to have again. There are those special times in life, aren't there, when we've got to really try to dial in our spiritual attention. Those times, those particular times when, when other things just need to take a back seat, like Brother Anderson tonight. He's exactly where he needs to be. He's where God would have him to be, to give his special attention. It's his wife's mother, isn't it? He's got to give his special attention to her. She needs him to be there. So we have those moments in life when we need to, to, to focus, especially spiritually. God in the flesh was in her house, and yet she became obsessed with making sure that the bread didn't burn and that the napkins are folded correctly on the table. Now, y'all y'all go with me here. I'm using a preacher's imagination a little bit, okay? But it was a real house, and she was making real preparations in the kitchen. And there's a real son of God, apparently, in the next room, or maybe in that day and age in another part of the room. And, and she's all in a frenzy, and her vision is getting blurred. She's forgetting temporarily what Jesus is really all about, and he's attempting to correct her. The pressure of secondary details wrangled her focus away from him, who should have been the center of her particular activity then, uh, that is her interest. These other things wrested her attention away from him. And Jesus was mildly calling her back to it here. Mary was focused on Christ. Did you catch that in verse 42? Mary has chosen that good part. It's not going to be taken away from her. There's something important happening here. She's getting it. And she's chosen that. So we're going to talk in a little bit about how you have to make some choices along the way. You've made one tonight. Here you are sitting here on Thursday night. And are the predators playing tonight? Yeah. Predators are playing tonight. You know where some church members would be? That's where their attention would be. On Sunday nights, not everybody comes back that can and should, do they? Their attention is somewhere else. They're not focused on 
spiritual things on Sunday evening a lot of times. And that's just one illustration. So we'll dive back into this text shortly. Will you first allow me to state the obvious? We live in a busy world, don't we? It moves at a furious pace. Somebody noted that modern life often resembles a stomped anthill. When's the last time you've stomped an anthill? You want to see what life is like in America? Just go out here and find one of these, uh, uh, one of these anthills and stomp that thing or stir it with a stick. And you'll see that, that explosion of activity. Somebody said that's what life in a modern America is like. The result is we are chal challenged by many distractions. So many of our waking hours are spent with our minds set on things and concerned about things on earth, things we have to pay attention to sometimes, and not things in heaven, not things above. A man named Pico Iyer, who was a British-born essayist and novelist of Indian uh, uh, origin, but Pico Iyer warned in an age of movement Nothing is more critical than stillness. You've got to pull over off the interstate from time to time. You've got to find that rest area. And church services, to me, are one of those rest, or some of those rest areas. The Bible said, long before Pico said that, Be still and know what? That I am God. Psalm 46.10. God said that. God made us. And God knows there are times when that we have to pull over and let our soul catch up. Or in our frenzy of activity, we lose our vision. We get blurry. We lose our focus. And we have to dial back in from time to time. And so the Apostle Paul was focused on Christ, and he said, This one thing I do. This one thing I do, Philippians 3.13. I forget what's behind. I made a lot of big mistakes. But I'm dialed in now. I'm focused on Jesus. And so in Philippians 3, 13 and following, this one thing I do, forget what's behind, and I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's a priority for me, Paul says. It's not second or third or fourth. I think about going to heaven all the time, he says. That's what my main goal is, to get to heaven. And I'm not going to lose my... Focus on Christ. I'm not going to let anything rob me of my reward in heaven. So he's dialed in there in Philippians chapter 3. So, uh, moving along here, there's a man named Tom Adams who makes us think about the danger of distraction that comes with the busy pace of modern life. He gave this witty driving tip. He said, if you rear end a car on the freeway, your first move should be to hang up your cell phone. But you know that's happening, isn't it? You know, there, 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 there's so many teenagers that are being injured and killed and others because of texting, trying to drive. Most states have passed laws about it now because we can't discipline ourselves to not try to do multitasking. You all know about multitasking, don't you? You know what multitasking is? It's really not doing any task very well. That's what multitasking is. You do the research. You read what the experts say. They, they're doing research on this tonight. But we don't multitask very well. You know why? God didn't make us to. Your brain is wired. Now, you can chew gum and walk at the same time, most of us. But I, I'll, I'll dare you to try to rub top of your head and pat your belly. You know, some, some of us have practice at that. Your brain is wired to do one thing well at, the, at one time. And multitasking, our culture is into multitasking. And so, so here... Sister Martha. Now let me quick tell you one more quick little story, and we're going to dive into this little story here, and, and we're going to visit Sister Martha's house here and, and try to go inside her house here. Some unknown man, get this now, a man related the following. He said he was driving to the office that morning on the interstate. He looked over in the left lane, and there was a woman in a brand new Mustang doing 80 miles per hour on the other side, on the other lane there. She had her face right up in the rearview mirror, and she's putting on her eyeliner and lipstick. He said he looked back to the highway, and I looked back in front of me and said a couple of seconds. When I looked back, she had drifted halfway over my lane. And he said, that frightened me. And so he said, she's still working on her makeup, but that frightened me so badly, he said, that I swerved to the right. That caused me to drop my electric shaver. <laughs> and he said, that knocked the donut off my right thigh. And then in all the confusion of trying to straighten out the car by using my knees against the steering wheel, I dropped my cell phone in the cup of coffee between my legs, which 
was splashed and burned my thigh and ruined my phone and disconnected me from an important call to the office. Women drivers, he said. <laughs> I don't believe Sister Martha ever drove a Mustang down the interstate, do you? While applying her makeup. But look back to verse 40 in the text. The text said, She was distracted and worried, Jesus said, and troubled about many things. Meanwhile, her sister Mary made a better choice. She chose that good part which would not be taken from her. Let us focus our attention for a few minutes on this incident. I love Sister Martha, don't you? I'm telling you, I, I love Sister Martha. Let me tell you why. First of all, in John 11, Jesus loved her. The text says in John 11 that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and their brother Lazarus. Now, my friends, think about that for a moment. Jesus was God in flesh, wasn't he? John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14. 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, but then the Word became flesh. The Word always was God, preexistent with God in eternity. Jesus was deity long before he became a person. But at a specific moment in time, he became flesh. He was, Colossians 2, 9, uh, he, he, was, he was deity in bodily form. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then in Hebrews 2, 14, the Hebrew writer said, he shared in our flesh and blood. And the NIV says there, he shared our humanity. And so here he is in a house. And they're apparently preparing a meal for him. Why is he in Martha and Mary's house? Because he's trying to stay focused on something. Bethany is two miles east of Jerusalem on the other side of the Mount of Olives. And I've stood on top of that Mount of Olives. Some of you have. And off to the eastern slope, you go down toward Jericho and off into the Dead Sea Valley down there, the Jericho River Valley. Uh, that is the Jordan River Valley. But, but on the west side, you go down into Kidron off the Mount of Olives in the Kidron Valley, and then up in the Jerusalem proper. Well, Jesus was still on the east side of the Mount of Olives, so he had to go on up over that and down into the Kidron and then up into Jerusalem. So he's about two miles away from Jerusalem that evening. And so it, it's no shock, since he was God, but he's in flesh, he's sharing humanity, it's no shock. He wants to be with people who love him and people he loves. Now, Luke 10, 38 and following is one of the few accounts in the Gospels where Jesus is visiting in a private home. And so we know nothing about how he came to know Mary and Martha or even if he had met them before this occasion, though it seems very likely to me that he had. But it is clear these two sisters desired to extend hospitality to Jesus, a place to rest and refresh and relax, and it is clear he gladly accepted that invitation. It would be good here for you to glance back at Luke 9, verse 51 in your Bible, where Luke explains that when the time had come for him to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, where his destiny is to go to the cross. In John 11, verse 1, we learn that this village is Bethany, the town of Mary and Martha, on the eastern slope two miles east of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives. So it is, as he's on his way to die in Jerusalem, he stops off in Bethany for a meal. And a certain woman, Luke 10, verse 38 says, a certain woman in that village named Martha welcomed him into her house. John 12, verse 2 would tell you of this same house and this same woman that there they made him a supper, made Jesus a supper. There they made him a supper sometime after he raised Lazarus. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Oh, isn't that beautiful? I love that. Martha served, but Lazarus sat at the table. Now, let's just get honest here with ourselves just for a minute. There's several Lazaruses in here tonight, brothers in Christ. And there's a bunch of Marthas sitting here tonight. And when there's a meal served... And you're going to bring home-cooked food to a potluck or you're going to have guests in your home with your family. Somebody got to spend some time in the kitchen, don't they? You can't just send down to McDonald's and get a bunch of Big Macs if you really want to impress your family. Oh, you can, and we do sometimes. 
But if you can have it done right in the old-fashioned way as we think of it, and still the best way, really, somebody's got to serve, don't they? And even as Lazarus sits at the table with Jesus, Martha is in there in the kitchen. Somebody has to be if there's going to be a table to sit around. Well, I'm thankful for all the Marthas in our homes and the church, aren't you? Who do you think does most of the heavy lifting when it comes to these kind of things? What would the Carthage Church of Christ do without the Marthas in the congregation here? Without those people who cook and visit and teach children and see to their household. Godly women in the Lord's Church, I hear folks saying, I actually had a brother left the church. He fell away at Smithville years ago. And I went and visited him and said, why don't you leave and take your wife with you? He said, because you don't let the women do anything. Now, I tried to reason with him. <laughs> bud, sit down, little, sit down, bud, for a few minutes and let me explain to you that the Smithville Church of Christ would probably have to close its doors if it wasn't for the Marthas in the congregation. And I think most of you men understand what I'm talking about. Of course, they don't serve as preachers and elders because the Bible doesn't extend that role to sisters in Christ. But there's so many things our sisters do, like Sister Martha was doing. She was a servant, and I'm going to guarantee you that whatever Jesus is trying to get across to her in this text, you can dismiss the idea he's scolding her because she's active and busy and serving. That's not the point here. Do you have a Martha in your life tonight, Lazarus? Thank God for her and give her a break occasionally. Cook for her, or better yet, take her out to one of Bethany's fine restaurants every now and then. And let Sister Martha get a rest. Well, well, all that having been said, now let's look at Martha here again in verse 40. She was distracted with much serving, Luke says. She approached him, said, Lord, don't you care? My sister's left me to serve alone. Tell her to help me. Now there she stands in the doorway between the dining room and the living room. She's got her hands on her hips. And sweat is on her brow from feverish activity. Fire is in her eyes and a tone of frustration and even anger. You can hear it in her voice. She's a busy woman. There's much serving that needs to be done. A lot of preparations have to be made. And she's very irritated with her sister and even ticked off at Jesus a little bit for not feeling the way she feels about it. Unable to, continue, to contain her irritation and frustration, verse 40 in the text says, in a very mild translation here, she approached him, the new King James says. But that's far too weak to capture what is happening here. She confronted him. It would be proper to say that. That's what the Greek would bear out. And then the Greek word is epistemi, E-P-I-S-T-E-M-I is how we spell it. And Strong's Concordance says it means to stand up, to be present, to assault. And there's a Greek scholar named A.T. Robertson. I guarantee you, Brother Anderson has heard of this man. I've got a whole set of books by him where he parses out a lot of the Greek the words in the New Testament and gives the definition and so forth, one of the foremost scholars in modern times. And A.T. Robertson writes about this Greek word translated approached here, that it really means stepping up to or bursting in on Jesus. It is an explosive act, he said, and an explosive speech. She's assaulting our Lord verbally. She's irritated with him. She's irritated with her sister Mary. And she's letting Jesus know exactly how she feels. She had two complaints. Mary was not helping in the kitchen with the meal preparations, number one. And number two, Jesus was not doing anything about it. And so Martha did what we are tempted to do when irritated and frustrated with others in the church or in our families. What do you do when you get frustrated with other people in the church or in your family and you don't think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing? Well... She questioned the Lord's care. Don't you care? And then she said to Jesus, tell her to help me. And now we have Martha ordering the Lord around. You ever been so irritated with somebody in your family you start telling the Lord what they ought to do to that person? You ever seen somebody in the church and you think they ought to be doing more? Your perception is they're unplugged, they're not very spiritual, or they'd be getting their hands dirty? And you start telling the Lord what you think they ought to be doing about this situation, it's a very common response. She's losing her focus even more. And so the Lord, uh, she thinks he doesn't care. Do you not care that my sister has left me? Tell her to help me. You ever been in Martha's place? (laughs) 
presuming to tell the Lord what to do about something. Well, let us be reminded here that people have different spiritual aptitudes tonight. And Martha had a hands-on, practical-minded approach. Her area of greatest interest and activity was getting her hands dirty. She wanted to serve with her hands. And it bothered the daylights out of her that Mary wasn't that way too. But then in verse 39, Mary was quiet and reflected. She sat at Jesus' feet. She loved Jesus more with her mind and her heart than she did her hands. They're both loving Jesus, but in different ways. And it's amazing how these two siblings can be so different, isn't it? How is it in your house? We have two sons, Caleb and Joshua. Caleb's 35, Joshua's 30. And I'm telling you, they're, they're a male version of Martha and Mary, aren't they, Donna? They're just as different as daylight and dark. Caleb is hands-on. He can build anything, repair anything, fix anything, make anything. And he wants to be doing it for people all the time. Joshua is going to teach class for me in a week or so while I'm gone somewhere else. He's done it many. He likes to be in the books and praying and studying and talking to people about Jesus, but they're both serving God, one with his hand and one with his heart. We got that going on right here. Only Sister Martha kind of losing focus here just a little bit. So verse 40, the Bible said Martha was distracted. But please be careful to note that her distractions are not coming from negative, Ill, illegitimate pursuits. Not at all. We're not talking about her being out on the golf course on Sunday morning. She wasn't doing that. She wasn't missing church to watch her favorite soap opera or athletic team. She's not being distracted from personal Bible study and prayer time so she can catch up on Facebook and see what's going on. Or go shop at the mall with some girlfriends. It's not that kind of thing at all. She's not skipping church or those kinds of things here. Verse 40 says, King James Version, she was cumbered. The New National Version says distracted. Exactly what's the problem here? Verse 40, distracted, Luke says. The Greek word here means to drag all around, to distract with care. It means to show... To, uh, to, to drag all around, to draw all around. And one writer asks, I wonder if it showed on her face. I wonder if you could see the worry on her face about all these things that were pressing on her. Don't forget where Jesus is headed, to the cross. And there's a huge issue going on in that house that night. But Martha is not focused on them. Verse 41, Jesus told her, you're worried and troubled about many things. The word worried here is from the Greek word merimneo, and it means to be divided and distracted. Remember when Jesus said, what is your life? He said, do not worry about your life, Matthew 6, 25. What you will eat or what you will drink or your body, what you'll put on. Don't worry about those things. And several times from Matthew 6, 25 through verse 34, Jesus uses this same Greek word translated distracted or worry here in verse 40 in Luke 10 to tell us to not be losing our spiritual focus. Pull over here just for a moment and think about Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 25 at the end of the verse. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink nor about your body, what you'll put on. And what do we spend most of our time thinking about in America? We, th we think about our bodies a lot, don't we? We think about what we're going to wear. In a lot of cultures, it's not a matter of what am I going to wear to church today, it's can I find something to wear. But with us, it's what am I going to wear today? Do I want to wear red? Do I want to wear blue? Do I want to wear something that's got a mixture of colors? Do I want to match blue shoes with... You know, or if it's a man, do I want to wear my wingtips or do I want to wear my loafers? It's all about the body sometimes. And so Jesus said, don't, don't make life about all that. Don't lose your focus. And so in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. That's focus, my friends. When you put God first, that's focus. With all this distraction around us, it takes effort to focus on God. But you can do it. You can do it. That all reminds me of the story in the old days about the man in the mountains who bought a new bear hunting dog. And so he was eager to see how the hound would perform. And so he took the dog out to track a grizzly. 
And no sooner had they gotten into the woods than the dog picked up the trail, but suddenly he stopped and sniffed the ground a little bit and then bolted off in a new direction. He caught the scent of a deer who had crossed the path of the bear. A minute or two later, the dog halted again. This time he picked up the scent of a, of a raccoon that had crossed the path of the deer. Then it was a turkey and then a rabbit and then a cow. And finally, breathless, the hunter catches up with the dog only to find the dog barking triumphantly down the hole of a field mouse. Start off after a grizzly bear. Kept getting distracted, losing the trail. And it just seems to me sometimes that's what it's like in America. It, it's, a, it's a struggle to not just take off after all these things and put so much energy into them that we lose our focus, our main focus on Christ. So Martha's problem was something akin to that hounds. She loved Jesus, you can bank on that, but she was chasing several things that evening. And there was something major going on just a few feet away. She lost her focus on the most important person and thing that she could possibly be thinking about. There are two good women in view in this text, and they have much to teach us about maintaining a proper focus as we seek to live faithfully for Jesus. Some of you have heard about the placard sitting on the desk of the CEO of a huge corporation. And the message on it said, the main thing is to make the main thing the main thing. It's so hard to make the main thing the main thing sometimes. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Mary had it figured out. She, she probably was concerned about the meal too. But she knew this is a moment I'll never be able to have again. And she was focused on that important moment. And so, Mary, Martha's problem, she lost her focus. Now, our time is rapidly getting away, so we want to try to rush on over here and talk about the fact that we're all busy. She's a busy lady here. She's very busy. And the Bible said that Mary, down in verse 42, has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. I think that a good touchstone for us to all use as we feverishly pursue things, a good touchstone for us to ask uh, very frequently is, will this thing I'm putting so much of my life into, will it be taken away from me? Can it be taken away from me? If it can be taken away from me, why am I putting so much of my energy and life into it? If it's that which can't be taken away from me, if it has to do with eternity, then that's a good thing to really focus my attention on. Bible study, and reading, visiting with people, ministering to people, teaching little children, and yes, cooking and sharing meals with people with the express intent of serving them and even trying to reach them for Christ, but investing ourselves in the kingdom of God, frequently doing so, even as we have to chase these other rabbits and things and go about our daily lives, but keeping Christ square in the middle of all of that so that He's our main focus in life. We're all so very busy. Technology has speeded us up. Down there in Smithville, we have young parents who on some weekends will do a 300-mile round trip following their ch children on some traveling baseball or basketball team. And I'm not against baseball and basketball. But when you've got two days to travel 300 miles and play three games and get back home, it's difficult to get church in there sometimes. And it can cause people to lose their focus on important things. Back in 2006, a man named Dr. Edward Hallowell wrote a book called Crazy Busy, Overstretched, Overbooked, and About to Snap. Crazy Busy. Listen to the promo for that book, the audio version of it that's, that's on an online site promoting it. It said, look at what's happened to the usual how are you exchange between people. It used to go like this, how are you? Fine. Now it goes like this, how are you, busy, or I'm too busy, or crazy man, it's just crazy busy. He said without intending for it to happen or knowing how, when or why it got started, many people find that they now live in a rush that they never wanted. If you feel busier than you've ever been and wonder how this happened and how you can keep the pace up much longer, he said you're hardly alone. And then he goes on and says some other things. I know people that if you ask them, how you doing, they'll say busy. Just busy, busy, busy. 
And it's almost like a badge they wear, that they're so proud, they're so busy. And if you do some research on this, doctors, uh, psychiatrists, and sociologists will tell you that for some people at least, that being busy is a substitute because they don't want to be spending too much time alone. It might suggest to them deep in their psyche that I'm not very important to anybody else if I get still and don't have something filling up every moment of every day. And I'm just suggesting to you that Sister Martha and Sister Mary here show us that we need to stay focused. Stay focused on Jesus Christ. Find a way to keep a focus on Christ even in the midst of all this frenzy. Now, let's, let's just quickly turn over Colossians 3, very quickly, where Paul tells us if we've been raised with Christ, to seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you die, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Did you know in Nashville, Tennessee, that they're preparing for this next hockey game that will come up in after the weekend here? They're preparing to have 100,000 people watch that game at these big monitors that they're sitting up in different places. They had 50,000 over there the other night, and I heard that set a record. No hockey, there's no team, there's no city in the, in the United States that's ever had 50,000 people show up outside the arena to watch a hockey game. They got a hockey mania over there. They get, they're in a frenzy over there, some people. They're traveling from Alabama and Memphis and Arkansas. They're, they're coming to Nashville, Tennessee. It's the hottest spot on earth right now because of the predators. Some people live for that. That's their life. Oh, you know what Paul means when he says, when Christ who is our life, we all understand what that means. He's talking about passion for Jesus Christ. He's talking about Jesus being first in our lives, not, not just a compartment that we go to on Sundays or in times of need, but as the Lord of our lives. He's a living, risen Christ, and we're deeply in love with Him. We're longing to go to heaven, like Paul said, forgetting what's behind and pressing on this one thing, making sure that I'm going to get to heaven and be with Him someday. I'm not going to get so distracted and, and my vision blurred and lose my focus to the point that I ever leave Him or His body the church. And I think that's what Paul is getting at here. In verse 2, the word set in the Greek can mean to become fixed or hardened or congealed. And that's the way it's used in this verse. We are to fix our minds on Jesus Christ, on things above. And the present tense of the Greek here means we keep on doing it. We keep setting our minds on heaven. We keep them set there day by day by day. Former President George H.W. Bush once said in speaking about an upcoming election, I think the undecideds could go either way. Y'all remember the Bushism? I think the undecideds could go either way. I think Paul is warning us to not be undecided about serving Jesus, but to make him the focus, make his church and the kingdom of God be a part of our focus in our lives. Let him be our life. So, I think that first bell should be getting about ready to go off. About four more minutes. Well, we'll just go a little bit further here then. And then we'll... Uh, We'll wrap this up. Now, we're talking about four minutes before the bell or four minutes before the end. Four minutes to the bell, to the first bell. I just want to make sure I understand where we're at here. All right. So, so if you've got your Bible, quickly turn it to uh, the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, and verse 25. 4 and 25. 3,500 years ago, Solomon was trying to instruct his son about the importance of focus. Words not used in the Bible, but the concept is all over the Bible. Look at verse 25, Proverbs 4. Let your eyes look straight ahead, and your eyelids look right before you. Talking about focus. When that professional baseball player lets that ball go, does anybody know how long that batter has to decide whether or not to hit it? Or let me say whether or not to try to hit it. I don't know the exact amount, but it's less than a quarter of a second. He lets that ball go, and sometimes it reaches 95 plus miles per hour if he's good, or 98 in some cases. 
and he lets that thing go. How on earth can anybody have any hope, no matter how, what kind of skill set that, uh, that batter has, how on earth can he hope to hit that ball? What's he got to do? He's got to say it out loud if you pick up on it. He's got to keep his eye on the what? On the ball. He's got to keep his eye on the ball. What if it curves? He's got to be waiting for that. He's got to keep his eye on the ball. What if, it, what if it's a slider and it drops in on him? Try to keep your eye on the ball and decide whether or not to strike at it. Solomon is telling his son, maintain your vision. We all know Solomon made a bunch of mistakes, big ones. He let his wives talk him into idolatry, and he left the Lord, temporarily at least. But he got it figured out by the end of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and in verse 13 he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. I've done all this experimenting in life. Let us hear the conclusion. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is the all of man, one translation says. So when you think of focus, keep your eye on the ball. I'm going to tell you this, and I think our time will be gone. There's a man named James Montgomery Boyce. He's a denominational preacher, but he wrote a book called Learning to Lead in 1990. He related a really interesting story about... Uh, Henry Aaron and Yogi Berra. Berra was the New York Yankees' renowned catcher, of course, and Aaron was the, uh, at, at the time, he was playing for the Milwaukee Braves and was the chief power hitter for them. He went on to set the, and hold the all-time record for home runs for some 30-plus years until Barry Bonds came along past him on August 7, 2007. And some of us questioned Bonds' performance, of course, because of performance-enhancing drugs. But this boy is told that the Yankees and the Braves were playing in the World Series way back. And as Boyce tells it, Yogi was, as usual, keeping up his ceaseless chatter, and he was trying to pep up his uh, teammates on the one hand and distracting Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee batters on the other. And as uh, Henry Aaron came to bat that day, Yogi, sitting behind him as catcher, tried to distract him and said, Henry, you're holding the bat wrong. He said, you're supposed to be able to read the trademark. Well, Boyce tells that Aaron didn't say a word. When the next pitch came down the pipe, he slammed it out into the left field bleachers. He trotted around the bases. When he crossed home plate, Yogi was standing there silent now. And as he went by him, Aaron stopped and looked at him when he tagged home and said, I didn't come up here to read. I didn't come up here to read. There's a man that had focus, professional focus. He kept his eye on the ball literally and he became the greatest home run hitter there had ever been until Bonds passed him, perhaps with the use of some drugs that enhanced his performance. That's all debatable. Henry Aaron is one of the greatest batters that ever picked up a baseball bat because he could focus. And I'm laboring tonight to say to us, Sister Mary and Sister Martha both have something to say to us about not getting distracted by even necessary things that have to be done. But don't let them become primary things. Keep God and His kingdom first in your life. And so Martha in the kitchen, serving with her hands, occupied for Jesus with her pots and pans, loving Him yet fevered, burdened to the brim, careful, troubled Martha occupied for Him. Mary on the footstool, eyes upon her Lord, occupied with Jesus, drinking in His word. This is the one thing needful, all else strangely dim. Loving, trusting Mary, resting Mary, occupied with him. So may we, like Mary, choose the better part, resting in his presence, hands and feet and heart, drinking in his wisdom, strengthened with his grace, waiting for his summons and our eyes upon his face. When it comes, we're ready. Spirit, will, and nerve. Mary's heart to worship. Martha's hands to serve. This the rightful order. As our lamps we trim. Occupied with Jesus. Then occupied for Him. If you want to find the source of spiritual power of the great people in the New Testament, you've got to understand that they were first occupied with Jesus. And that's why they were so powerfully occupied for him but they stayed occupied with him they loved him with all their hearts he was their number one passion 
And if we have that today, we'll be making an impact not only in our families, but beyond our families, in the church of the Lord, our neighbors, and our reputation and our influence will live long after us. I hope God will help you stay focused on the main things in life. I'm going to stop whether I'm supposed to or not, and now we're going to offer an invitation. All right. So we've been talking about spiritual focus, right? We've been talking about keeping first things first. So we'll, we'll offer Jesus' invitation tonight by asking if you want to turn to quickly to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And we'll just read three verses here. So this writer has just talked about Abraham and Sarah and about Isaac and Jacob and Moses. And this whole list of heroes, how they lived by faith and accomplished all these great things. But his, some of his readers are getting discouraged. They've been Christians for a while. The new is a little bit worn off. The shine has kind of gotten dull a little on Jesus. He's not as attractive to some of them as he used to be. And they're thinking about going back to Moses. You can see that warning throughout the book. Now we come to chapter 12 after this great hero of faith uh, chapter here. And here's what the writer says. Remembering now that these divisions in the chapters and verses weren't there until about a thousand years after Christ, okay? So he's got one continuing thought here. Therefore, he says, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance or perseverance or patience the race that is set before us. Looking, now watch this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. What keeps people from going to heaven? They get discouraged in their souls. What keeps people from ever getting in the Christian race? They don't take a good long look at Jesus and who he is and what he did through the cross and the death and burial and resurrection. And this writer says, looking unto him, verse 2. The New International Version says, fixing your eyes on him. And the Greek word literally means that, to fix your eyes. It means to turn your eyes away on purpose from things that are more trivial and on purpose focus on the important thing. It's a conscious choice that we make. And he's asking us to do this. Some of you are keep, have kept up with technology's advances in warfare, and you know that we can drop a bomb now and have a laser-guided bomb or a laser-guided missile, and they can place it uh, a thousand miles away. They can place it in a space that's about five by five, five feet by... They can put it through a door in a hangar in Syria off of a ship sitting out in the Mediterranean Sea. They did that not long back. Because of that device's ability to fix, to lock in, and the writer says, lock in on Jesus. Because he went to the cross. He died for our sins. By God's power, he raised up. And if you'll come to him on his terms, placing your faith in him, repenting of your sins, turning your life over to him, confessing his sweet name before witnesses, and then being buried with him in baptism, where you rise up to walk in newness of life, buried in baptism, Join with him there, united with him there, your sins forgiven by his blood through that through that symbolic act of baptism. Rise up to walk a brand new life. And then you'll be a child of God. And if you keep your focus where it needs to be, someday heaven will be your home. Will there be one in this in this room tonight? Just one. Do you have any need that is a spiritual nature that this good congregation can pray with you or for you? Or if need be, baptize you into Christ for forgiveness of your sins. Would you come while we sing this invitation song together?